Welcome to this edition of Rattling the Buzz. I'm your host, Max Moose. And I'm Maximilian Alvarez, editor-in-chief here at The Real News Network. And don't worry, I am just here in The Real News studio keeping Mansa's seat warm. Uh, we weren't able to get him in the studio today, but we wanted to bring y'all uh, this timely conversation because, as we know, it is the holiday season. And the holiday season, as you can probably guess, is the most painful time to be locked up out of the year, right? And we're going to talk about that today. And this is something of a tradition that I started with our dearly departed brother, mentor, and colleague, Marshall Eddie Conway. As Real News viewers and listeners know, brother Eddie Conway uh, founded this show, Rattling the Bars, here at the Real News Network after being incarcerated for 44 years as a political prisoner. Eddie was locked up on trumped up charges and held wrongfully for nearly half a century. And afterwards, uh, before he joined the ancestors earlier this year in February, Eddie did incredible work here at the Real News Network and beyond. And it was truly, truly an honor to get to work with him, even for a short time. And in fact, while I've been here at the Real News Network, as editor-in-chief uh, since October of 2020, I only got to record one one-on-one -on -one interview with Eddie. And it was this interview. It was this interview that we did two years ago on this topic where I wanted to talk to Eddie about uh, why it is such a devastating and lonely and painful time to be incarcerated around the holidays uh, and what folks watching and listening can do to support those who were locked up and their families and their communities at this time of year. Um, and so I wanted to keep that tradition alive and, and uh, asked Mansa if he'd be okay with me uh, coming back on uh, his show, which um, Mansa has, has taken over hosting duties this year. It's been incredible to work with him and watch the show grow under his leadership. And I'm sorry you can't be in the studio with me today, brother, but I really appreciate you uh, agreeing to, to have me back on it so we could have this conversation because I think, as we both agree, it's, it's really important to remind folks this time of year not to forget about our brothers, sisters, and siblings who are locked up right now. And so I wanted to just sort of start there, right? Um, Eddie, as I mentioned, was locked up for 44 years. You yourself, as you've talked about on this show, were locked up for 48 years. Uh, I was wondering if we could start by just having you talk to folks out there who have never lived through something like that, couldn't even imagine what living through something like that entails. Could you talk to us about um, what it's like as much as you can. There's, there, there's only so much we could ever understand about it. But I guess for folks out there watching, listening, who want to know, what would you say to folks out there about what it's like being locked up around the holidays, why it's such a painful time, and what you think folks on the outside don't see about what folks are thinking and feeling and what's going on on the inside around this time of year? Yeah, I'm, actually, I'm glad you did bring this up because it's a, a myriad of things that go on during this time as far as the holiday and the effect that it has on many women that are held captive on the plantations. Uh, I think of like the uh, Charles Dickinson or uh, Christmas Carol. Or, you know, I think about the bar humbug. I think all these adjectives are descriptive of the uh, prison administration's overall mannerism and disposition towards people that are incarcerated or held captive in terms of acknowledging or seeing the uh, holidays and, and, and make a connection between holidays and humanity. I know holiday and humanity, because mindful, be mindful that all of them celebrate the holidays. The gods come in, you know, Christmas, they drunk, you know, they celebrate the holidays, they celebrate New Year's, they celebrate Easter. They celebrate Thanksgiving. They so they celebrate these holidays, but there is a disconnect when they come into the environment because in the environment they're not uh, prone to express or show any type of humanity as a general principle. It's not all. It's not everybody, but as a general principle. So 
it's against that backdrop that 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 you see the evolution of, and I and this is where I want to take this at. That you see the evolution of when you say, how is it in prison for people on the holiday, and cross the board is depressing. Uh, that's that's a given fact. Whether we whether we amass out uh, being depressed, uh, or whether we act out on it, it's depressing because. One, you can't be with your loved ones. Two, you have limited access to them. And uh, three, for most people, like they relive like years of being incarcerated and not, not being able to have any impact on their family during, during this period, or revisiting them how they, when they was growing up, how they had the disadvantage. So, I know from my, my own personal experience, it, I, I became like numb to. Uh, holidays in terms of any type of c celebratory activity. Uh, we as comrades, we would we would do we would do little things together, you know, drink homemade wine, uh, stuff like that, you know, and that was how we interacted with each other, uh, reminisce about what we did on the street. But overall, the the, the prison environment is it has a blanket of depression over you. Uh, they give you a traditional holiday meal. Uh, so you feed 1,600 people, uh, or you feed 2,000 people, or you feed 2,500 people. The, you, and all the delicacies coming out, you know, the pies, the turkey, uh, uh, any of the delicacies that's coming out during that period, that, they fair game for the black market. So you might go in the kitchen and might, they might say, well, you got uh, pies on the line. It depends on what line you coming through, because by the fourth line, all the pies might be stolen, and then you getting jello, and then that's even more depressing because you put your mind and wrap your mind around like, okay, I'm I, this is what you wrap your mind around, and this it might seem a little mundane, but this is what they wrap, we wrap our mind around, and it created more tension and more depression. Uh, the food, you know, because you're trying to serve so many people at so much time, you trying to get them in and get them out. The food might not be well prepared. Uh, the food might be cold. That creates a a a, a sense of uh, tension. So you know, overall, that's the atmosphere in general that you find in prison. Now, when you look at how do we deal with it, all right? And I'm reminded of this in 1980. I want to say 84. Or 83 in the Maryland Penitentiary. The, the prison had got so so much tension between the officers and the prisoners, it got to a point where the younger prisoners just decided they weren't taking no more. So they just, they just it was all out war with, with the police. So they was in the yard slinging knives and they came in, they shot some of them with, you know, with, with real bullets and whatnot. And we was locked down. We was locked down. We went on lockdown in the Maryland Penitentiary. We went on lockdown around. October. In October, we stayed locked down to like November. And the warden back then was calling out the inmate representatives to try to get, because they knew they couldn't leave the jail like it was going to become a match. The longer we stayed locked down, the more match we was going to become. So it wasn't healthy for nobody. So they kept on, so they had, they was calling up these guys to talk about how could we resolve this. And what happened was, we created what they call family day. So now in terms of how do we deal with it, this is how we deal with it. We always try to create some type of program, project, or activity where we brought our families in the prison. That we that we that we was able to try to get that. That's the that's the part of that of this that uh, goes unnoticed by society because when you have like people coming in the prison, we had family day. So on family day, we was able to get, we had toys. We, did, we, we was able to have like unlimited family members come in, unlimited children come in, and they gave you two hours in the auditorium. And you had, you selected your time and your date. And so your kids was able to come in there. They was able to get some toys and it was able, you was able to interact with your family. But that didn't come from the prison administration, that didn't come from them saying, like, we need to have a sense of humanity. What can we do 
to create an environment where we had these men and women uh, feeling some type of sense of community and some kind type of uh, emotion towards their families. So that's that's how we dealt with it on one level, right? Well, I want to I want to ask a little more about that, right? Because this is something that Eddie and I talked about two years ago when we talked about the same topic, right? And I know this is this is something that you on the show and Eddie on the show before you are constantly stressing, right? The 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 kind of person it makes out of you when you are living in these inhumane conditions in prison, like you said, the modern day plantations when you are so thoroughly cut off from the outside world and from your family, your community, not just like in the physical sense, like you are imprisoned in a cell uh, for years on end. You could even be in solitary confinement for Christ's sake. But also all the other ways that the prison industrial complex cuts people off from their support network. You can't even hug your family anymore. You know, a lot of these prisons will only let you talk to your family through a phone, a video phone machine that you got to pay an arm and a leg for just to see your loved one for a few minutes. But you lose that human touch. You lose that that sense of intimacy. That's all gone. And Eddie and I talked about, like, what that does to you as a person and especially around the holidays, because mm-hmm. it's a time when we remember from our childhoods being around our family, right. being in that warm embrace of community, of togetherness, of celebration. And that just makes it all the more painful to not have that. And mm-hmm. I and I really do think like during the first couple of years of COVID-19, when a lot of us were like in lockdown and staying at home, those of those of us who could. Of course, many people had to risk their lives to to get a paycheck, um, you know, at that time. But for those of us who were staying inside and working inside, we got just a tiny, tiny taste of what that isolation is like, the cabin fever, the the everything else. But I think one of the profound realizations that I came to was I was like, I literally am falling apart as a human being, not being connected to other people. Like my my body is hurting more. I'm I'm like I'm letting myself go. I'm not sleeping well. Like I'm not happy as much. Like even just that momentary mm-hmm. isolation from other people made me start kind of falling apart. And so I can only imagine. I, I can't imagine what it's like to endure that in the worst place imaginable, like you and Eddie were in for over 40 years. Um, I I wanted to ask if you could just talk about like that, like why it was so important for you guys to fight for that family day and what it means to not have that and how that all boils over around this time of year. And and you know what, that's a good uh, question. Because in George Jackson, in the prison letters, in, in his intro, he talked about the struggle is the struggle for our individuality. That everything is they do is have us function on a herd instinct. That they that we're lumped into this uh, plantation mentality where we're numbers and and we operate pro accordingly, right? And so it's in holidays in prison. Like I said, is is probably the most depressing time for a person. But then you put on top of that. When you find yourself like I got, I'm in prison and I'm serving multiple life sentences. I'm in prison and I got a twenty or uh, twenty nine release date. It's 2019, and uh, and the environment is so unruly and so disruptive that for the most part, this is the environment that you find yourself in now. For the most part, you stay on lockdown. So in order to like not be consumed by that the, the, that environment, you you try to stay focused on maintain your sanity by uh, being focused on what your priorities are in terms of how you want to adjust. What you put on top of that, then you're going to put on top of it. That's just a normal way of living. I got to come out. I got to try to maintain my sense of sanity. Uh, doors both hit for wreck. They don't. All right. Man, what's the problem? We don't like that. But then you put on top of that a holiday 
And every time you turn on the TV, it's Jingle Bells, Deck the Halls. It's a turkey. It's an Easter bunny. It's somebody with a crazy mask, a Freddy Krueger mask on. It's Halloween. And you can't, you try to relate to those things because your family, but at the same token, you can't internalize them in terms of having no sensitivity towards them. I'm going to give you an example. Before I got, I, I had life sentence. Before I got my sentence cut, everything I seen on TV, I just looked at it for, as if I was looking through a magazine. It's unattainable. It has no meaning other than uh, my senses absorbing it for references in the conversation or whatever. Uh, so that's how I was thinking. Holidays, same way. I talk to my family. I go through the motion. But really, I'm not internalized. And when I got my sentence cut, I'm 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 in and I'm in a pre-release system, so I know I'm getting ready to get out. I'm looking at TV and I see something around because I got out December the 5th of 2019. So at least so I'm leading up. I, I, I talk to the people about Thanksgiving. They talking about the turkey and and they saying like, yeah, next time, you know, uh, we gonna make sure that we get your favorite, whatever, because you won't be here. Next Thanksgiving, all right. So then the same thing with Christmas, and then I'm sitting back and and to go to your, you know, like to resonate your point. I still couldn't grasp that I was going to be in an environment where I would be able to engage in this because I had been so institutionalized to suppress any emotions towards it. So when I so when I finally did get out. And it's and and I'm in a, an environment that's festive, and I got my family, and there's kids around, and they doing what kids do, the ones that believe in Santa Claus, the ones that's excited about what their parents got. I couldn't really uh, uh, embrace it, other than like I was looking at it, I was feeling good about it, but I couldn't really get into the mood because I had been I had suppressed this so many years, and that's then that there in that. That's where the problem is, because the system doesn't provide you with this uh, opportunity to humanize yourself. That's why the family days became important. That's why we sat down and we got together, Eddie included. We got together and, and it's an environment and came up with ideas of like, what can we propose to the administration to give us to humanize this, these people to get their families in here? So they can so they can be humanized enough to say, have some hope about getting up out of there. Because as I said earlier, you got because it's a depressed environment, you have a high risk, high substance use disorder that goes on during that period. Whatever it is that they can use to get mind altered, they're using it. You have a, a high uh assault rate because of like the a short fuse, because I don't really like, you know, you happy about you know, you might be, you just might be one of them persons that's like, I'm not going to let it bother me. So you might walk around with a homemade Santa hat on. And then you made me mad because I'm depressed. So now I say something crazy to you about, man, take that goddamn uh, piece of cardboard off your guy. And you say, oh, this is Santa hat. I'm Santa Claus. You make a wish. Now I'm ready to kill you. And then we, now, now, now they saying like, oh, man, they, they locked in jail. And say, what happened? Oh, uh, Slim and Dome 2 was fighting Santa Claus. You know? And because I can't relate to that, and the person that can relate to that, we clash because the institution whole design is to make us feel less than human, less than human. We under they want us to make sure that they, we feel that we are actually under the Thirteenth Amendment that we're servitude because of what we've been convicted of, and that we have a servitude disposition, and that's it. That's all. Anything you get from us during this period is us doing that because that's what we want to do, not because we feel a sense of humanity towards you. Right. I mean, like, and this was something that, that Eddie mentioned as well two years ago when we talked was like that, that transfer of hostilities, right? Um, where just moments when you're passing people in the halls, like maybe you bump into someone and it could flare up because of everything you just described, because of all that stuff that's going on under the surface, because of all the dehumanization that you're feeling, uh, because of the the institutional 
dehumanizing setting that you're locked in. Um, you know, that's why uh, suicides are highest mm -hmm. this time of year. Yeah. Like, I'm I, again, I'm sorry, everyone out there for, for like, you know, the, the heavy subject, but it, we, we can't look away from this. We, we have to acknowledge why so many people, uh, our fellow people, are killing themselves, ending their lives on the inside around this time of year. We need to understand why, and we need to understand what we could potentially do um, to help right? To lessen that burden. Of course, we know that dismantling this monstrous prison industrial complex needs to be the ultimate goal. And Mansa reminds us of that every single week with the incredible work that he does on this show. But in the meantime, while we're working towards that goal, Mansa, I wanted to ask, like, if you could, if you could share with us, like, some, some thoughts on, on what people out there watching and listening can do like you and Eddie did, when you were thinking of mm -hmm. ideas of how to maintain that human connection with people on the inside, um, you know, what can folks out there who are watching and listening to this right now do to show just a little bit of love, a little bit of kindness, and a little bit of humanity to those on the inside who receive so little of it, especially around this time of year? And, and, and you know what, Max, you, you mentioned that earlier about how, uh, you know, the, the system is so set up such that it, it makes it more impersonal for us to communicate with our family. Uh, you got emails, uh, you got uh, video uh, visits, you don't have contact visits, uh, and then you have, uh, you don't have like a lot of uh, time to spend with your family. I think that most of the, the main thing that people in the society and in this country, around the world at large, should think about is what would you, how would you feel if you found yourself in an environment and the, the holiday came up and the only reason why they not letting you have a visit, the contact visit to visit your family that day is because they sure don't stay or they don't feel like that's important enough. The things that we need people to understand is that it's imperative for you to impact and change the policy. These, these are your tax dollars that's going into uh, keeping these uh, plantation alive and, and bustling. And it's imperative that, that y'all, that society, really voice their opinion about that. People coming out, uh, everybody don't have a life sentence in prison. Everybody don't have triple life in prison. They coming out of prison ultimately, eventually. So it's imperative that people recognize that you need to talk to like uh, the con your con congressional representative. You need to talk to your state and local representative. That why not allow families to have conjugal visit? Why not allow the husband to have a conjugal visit with his wife? Why not allow the husband or the mother to have her children come into an environment where the mother can? Uh, be a essential part of the child's life in a structured environment. Why not? What's the problem with that? They coming back out of society. So it's imperative that people recognize that we're human beings. And I always say this when, whenever we talk about a subject matter, I'm always reminding people that we're talking about human beings. We're not talking about animals. We're not talking about people that don't have no feelings, that don't have no, that's not remorseful about the things that they might have done in the past, that don't have not displayed that sense of remorse and in terms of how they change. We're talking about people that really have feelings in, in our human being. We're not asking for you to take and ignore that uh, something happened. We're saying that look at the person and look at the situation and the condition that that person is in. If the design of the system is to help a person better themselves, because I'm always reminding everybody of this, that the sentence is what you get. It's crime and punishment. The crime is what I committed, what I, what I was charged with. I'm sentenced, and the punishment is my sentence. How much time I served. The punishment is not how you subject me to what, how you dehumanize me, how you subject me to the most inhuman condition. Uh, no, the sentence is to try to get me in a state of mind where ultimately I'm going to return to society. So I think that when, when, you look, when we look at prison throughout the United States, we know for a fact right this day that prisoners are creating 
programs, projects, and activities to try to get society, try to get their members and the family members in, and try to get the community to come into the environment so they can show them that they're human beings and so they can try to get them to uh, organize around changing the narrative when it comes to the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's so beautifully and powerfully put, and it's something that we so easily and willingly forget that it's supposedly the whole point of this system is to rehabilitate people. Mm -hmm. That doesn't, like, how are you going to rehabilitate someone when you have smashed their humanity to bits? How are you expecting them to reintegrate into society? after that and the answer again as you cover every week on this show is that well clearly that's maybe what the system says it's it's here for but that's not what it actually does it's there to break people it's there to mm -hmm. swallow people up it is there to disappear people into the bowels of a prison industrial complex that is so cold and so unfeeling and is so good at extracting money from everyone who is touched by it from the prisoners themselves to their families to the communities that they're in. And I wanted to just sort of like wrap this up, Mansa, first by thanking you again for, for mm -hmm. um, ag agreeing to do this, um, but, but also just to maybe end on like not necessarily a positive note, but a, but a slightly lighter note. Um, First, let me be the first to say from all of us here at The Real News, because this episode, uh, which we're recording here at the end of November, is going to come out next week. So from all of us here at The Real News to you, happy release day on the 5th. Brother, we are so, <laughs> so grateful to get to work with you. We're so grateful to get to see you out and about doing the incredible work that you do. So we love you and we are so happy for you. And, and we know that everyone watching and listening to this is also sending their best to you on December 5th. And also Merry Christmas, brother. I mean, yeah, um, I don't, I don't know if we're <laughs> going to see each other before the holidays, but, yeah. but I really hope that you are able to, to rest, relax and enjoy what can be enjoyed after everything that you've endured. I just kind of wanted to end on that note. Like you said, a lot of the, the majority of people who are incarcerated are going to come home at some point. Mm -hmm. um, what can we also do to, to try to make the holidays a little better, a little kinder, um, a little more manageable for folks like that? Like you, like this, like, like the situation you were in, in 2019. Um, I wanted to ask, like, ha has it gotten better at all? Are there, are there parts of the holiday that, you feel you can connect with, or is that just gone? Are there are there other parts of the holiday that maybe you've come to enjoy or appreciate since then? And and what can folks on the outside do to to help make that that home for people who are returning from, as I said, the worst place imaginable? And and I, you know what, I have gotten better because it'll be four years, uh, December the fifth, and just just the day where I work at. Uh, we was going to get some toys, collect some toys for people donating toys. I work for an organization that, that deal with men and women coming out of uh, prison. And we normally give their family members a list of, to get their kids what toys they want. So we was going to collect the toys for the kids. And then I see the kids coming in. And that's really, for me, that's the important thing. When I see the kids of the family, of the, of the parents that's locked up, when I see these kids with a smile on their face. So in terms of when we think about this, think about that. You know, the person that's behind the bars, behind the wall, locked in the cell, that person is a human being. That person got family. That person got children. You can you can invest in that the children. You can invest in providing them with toys. You can look you can look around and see who's doing what in terms of that. You can uh, be in a space where you can write people that's incarcerated, uh, encourage them. You can be you can do all these things to help. Let them know that you look at them as human beings, regardless of what the system, how the system look at them. And this is, and it's because of this network right here that we a, we're able to really communicate that to our viewers. And and as I seen when you talk about rally bars and Eddie Creators, when I see it from the, from the response that I'm getting from our viewers on rally bars, we got some well informed and well educated and well opinionated 
viewers, which makes it good for us to be able to do this kind of work and make people and, and bring people this information so they can discern or or analyze or critique whether or not they think it's important for a, a prisoner's child to have a toy or whether they think it's important for a prisoner that's locked up to have a, a card come to them saying Merry Christmas. Well, they think it's important for uh, the right, uh, the legislators say like, we think that they should have contact visits so that the men and women that's married can have contact visits. Well, you think that's important in terms of humanizing uh, that environment in the, in the, with the goal of ultimately dismantling it. And we ask that you continue to support Real News and Rattling the Bars so that we can continue to get this information out. Like Max said earlier, this is a subject matter that we take serious because the people that's in this environment during this time, they coming back out and years of being dumped on and dumped on and their emotions suppressed. When they come back out, it's, it's, it's a no brainer when they find themselves back in a society that's now I, I just got out. Now I'm back in a society that look at me less than human, less, less than a human being. Then they, they act out as less than a human being. When we got the opportunity to change that narrative right now, so we ask you continue to support Rattling the Bars and the Real News, Max. Hey baby, it's your show. Like I said, I'm just keeping <laughs> you. I'm just keeping your seat warm. I thought that was beautiful, but I guess any parting holiday messages you got for Rattling the Bars viewers and listeners, you close us out, brother. Uh, and and for the rattling bars and the real news, uh, folks, you know we appreciate your support. Uh, I definitely appreciate more than anything else. I, I appreciate your feedback because it's your feedback that gives me a sense of direction in terms of what subject matters I, I'm trying to get out. And it's your feedback, regardless of what Eddie Eddie was always say this to me. He said, when he, when we get ready to get into debate or something, he said, you know this, that we accept constructive criticism. And this is his way of opening the door of like, okay, so don't take what I'm saying personal. And so I don't take what people, when people feed, give feedback, I don't take it as a personal front on me. I take it as your views. And this is what the real news is. Because guess what? We're actually really the news and continue to support us. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.